<laughs> so Sharon's the first reader, Vanda's the second reader, and then we'll go from there. Another entrance. Got a good turnout today. So, Sharon. Okay. <clears throat> Space, view, other, nature, ecology, wilderness, earth, matter, sky, light, territory, demarcation, horizon, mapping, Arcadia, scenery, sublime, picturesque. Landscape is a, a, a conciliation between natural and human worlds and is therefore a synthetic category. As a category, it functions as a demarcation, both as an idea and an orientation towards an object of attention that integrates the viewer and the viewed into a horizon of perception. A landscape is always a landscape of time and doubly so. It is a time of year, a season and a time of day, morning, noon or evening as well as a kind of weather, um ton, rain or snow, sun or mist. In the presentation of this time, which unfolds with every image, the present of representation can do nothing other than render infin infinitely sensible the passing of time, the fleeting instability of what is shown. John Newton, I see from the ground of the image. This is an image someone sent from the Himalayas to me, living in a monastery in the Himalayas. She told me that she was living in Tibet now and that the mountains had reduced her to a tiny speck in the order of things. She added that she had never felt so happy. She also talked about the mystery of light, how the skies would suddenly open with flashes of strange illuminations. Landscape is a form arising out of the application of an aesthetic attitude to nature. As such, it presents an invested mode of looking or an intensity of viewpoint. This is a, northern, a fragment from a northern Song painting. So the Song dynasty divides between the northern and the southern. The southern Song is 12th, 13th. This is from 9th to 11th. 9th to 11th, so 11th, 12th, 13th century is Southern Song, then you get the Yuan Dynasty. This is what's called the Northern School. Chinese monochrome landscape painting has a long, continuous history based on sophisticated aesthetic principles. It is an outcome of the fusion of calligraphy, painting and poetry. Before painting, Guo would meditate for several days in order to empty his mind of habitual representations. This process of releasing the mind from fixed preoccupation opens out a vision of what should be retained and what passes through in order to realize the mind and nature is a continuous loop of becoming. This is one of the most famous Chinese paintings called Early Spring. So it's the 11th century. So if you think of European landscape painting, it's hundreds of years in advance. And also the aesthetic theory is very sophisticated. So I had a discourse on aesthetics from about the Tang Dynasty onwards, the seventh, eighth century. A mountain has water as blood, foliage has as hair, haze and clouds as its spirit and character. Thus, a mountain gains life through water, its external beauty through vegetation and its elegant charm through the haze and clouds. This is Koshi. Also wrote on art, wrote on aesthetic theory. This is again Northern Sung. Northern Sung is very austere and quite you, it's sort of more global landscape than the Southern School. So it's vast spaces, vast ranges of mountains, which are views the, what is perceived with what is understood as an idea, what is felt. So the 
The invisible chi is as important as what's visible. So they walk in mountains for a long time, long periods, and feel the lines of energy as much as see the landscape. So it's a sort of richer, more synthesized view of what is taking place within natural depiction. Landscapes are vast things. You should look at them from a distance. Only then will you see on one screen the sweep and atmosphere of mountain and water. Goshi. This is Southern Song. So you get a more intimate, softer, more lyrical, poetic feeling in Southern Song. But so something closer up, more hazy, more diffuse less based on drawing and much more on uh, a sort of painterly feeling. This is an album leaf, so it's quite small. Album leaves were usually in, I think, 12 paintings in a set or 10 paintings in, a, in an album, which fold up. Just re read this and then stand there. Sure. Max Lower wrote about the painters of the Southern Song. Instead of the changeless and therefore timeless aspect of nature in earlier painting, there now appears a sense of transitoriness, of impermanence. A new image time was created with time subtly and poignantly condensed into a brief, ex intensely experienced moment. In painting, such condensed moments were expressed in events like sunset, dusk and nightfall, a breeze, gusts of wind or squalls, a sudden shower, a gentle rain, or clearing skies, the luminous haze of a summer morning or the brewing fog in the early evening. There's a painter, Sashu, a Japanese painter monk. He's one of the most distinguished monks in the whole of Japan, but he, he traveled to China to study Zen or Chan Buddhism in the monasteries and found it is already in the Ming Dynasty. So he's a painter of the Maramachi period, which is one of the main revival periods of Buddhism in uh, in Japan. But he collected paintings, took them back to Japan. So some great Chinese paintings in in uh, J Japanese collections, which were some of them brought back by Seshu. Seshu was a, oh, I, I yeah. Yeah. Seshu was a Japanese priest and painter who visited China in order to study Chan Buddhism. Whilst on his travels, he was able to collect great examples of classical painting. He practiced what became known as a throne or splashed ink style of painting. Hasigawa Tohaku pine trees, 16th century. The, Momo, the Momoyama period in Japanese art was witness to a flourishing art of screen painting, which adorned interiors. The depictions of nature were infused with distinct decorative appeal that was a development from monochromatic scroll painting. It's one of the great screen paintings of Japanese art. Amazing. Almost, you, you'd, you'd take it to be modernist if you just saw it as an image. You wouldn't think it was 16th century. It's equivalent of Renaissance. Momoyama or early Edo, 16th to, 16 to 17th century. That's the height of screen painting. Very um, gorgeous colors and gilt and so sort of lavish, so they're hanging in interiors. This is an early Leonardo drawing. Leonardo did his first landscape drawing in 1473, and his last landscapes drawings were drawn just before his death. These late drawings represented different forms of deluges. This is in the Queen's collection. There's about 12 of them, They're quite small paintings, but they show vast 
cosmic events, so like the end of the world. So that's what he was thinking about. The image to come was a sort of vast deluge, the end of the world as a as a kind of storm. Amazing use of almost like the, the drawing becomes rhythmical and wonderful. Sal Albrecht Alt Altdorfer. Albrecht Altdorfer produced the earliest landscape paintings in Europe in the first part of the 16th century. These are two examples of these. So the, the, it's, it took off as a genre in the north, the northern Renaissance. And often had this feeling, you, you could almost abstract this into a, a Chinese 10th century painting. And it has this cosmic feeling, this feeling of cosmic landscape. So you almost capture the feeling of the curvature of the earth, vast distances. Joachim Passina invented the idea of the world landscape, early 16th century. So again, it's vast distances and like the extent of the world, boats just disappearing off the horizon. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. I can't read the bottom bit. By Jacqueline Patina, early 16th century. <laughs> this is a Bruegel painting of, again, this feeling of, um, it's a religious painting, but it's also a global landscape. Are we tying this in at this stage to sort of the exploration of Christopher Columbus and world mapping and trying to push boundaries? You're getting, it's the opening out of the world. So it coincides with exploration and almost you get the, um, also all painting coincides with the development of lenses and mirrors in general use. So you get a kind of um, use of lenses to paint and more detail with, with oil paints gave a feeling of greater density and luring. And I've just done a thing on the self-portrait and self-portrait coincides with the invention of the mirror and the, the glass mirror and lenses and the oil paint and a kind of almost the the, the self-portrait was a beginnings of autonomy of painting because it invariably not done for a specific commission so you get this first attempt to paint according to whim so you get a kind of independent I mean, you get it in, in China, you get this feeling of a independent, autonomous feeling of art, an art for art's sake. But it arrives in the West much later. It starts to surface with the Renaissance and with it also genre. Didn't read that. Do you want me to go, you want to go back? Oh, yeah, I just met. No, I just met. Pieter Bruegel the Elder was known for his landscape and peasant scenes. He was noted for his panoramic viewpoints as exemplified by landscape with a flight into Egypt, 1563. So you get the religious connotation is almost, uh, it's not centred, it's, it's, it's just there as almost an incidental detail. You notice someone passing through, but you wouldn't think it's a religious painting. Is Claude. Claude Lorraine's pastoral landscape, 1628. 
who is French, but most of his paintings were Italian in origin. His painting often introduced a focus on the effects of sunlight. Let's close. This is Caspar David Friedrich. And the sort of in, uh, indirect reference to, to, to the Trinity or the... It's interesting uh, just looking at those trees because someone's hacked off the branches. Um, yet it looks like it's sort of in a more remote landscape. There's obviously been some human intervention. Which is what landscape is, is nature plus human intervention. Yeah. Caspar David Friedrich developed his romantic aesthetic in conjunction with a mystical outlook on nature and the infinite. So the landscape served as a vehicle for both mystical feelings, mystical religious feelings, Christian feelings, and the idea of infinity. So it's both the sublime and the religious transcendence put together. I wonder whether in Western landscape painting any things are uh, not so much influenced by Christianity and this feeling of God. Um, many centuries ago, it appears to me that Asian landscape, Chinese, Japanese, tend to look at the nature and then go inside of human, inside of the interpretation, while Western landscape look at the landscape and think about outside uh, presence of God. And, um, I would imagine that's probably pretty much influence of Christianity. So before Christianity, what, what happened in landscape? That's my question. Well, you get in... In uh, particularly in the sun, you get these tiny figures in vast landscapes, so they become like little dots. So the, the scale of the human is very is diminished. You think much more of the temporality of mountains. The mountains exceed in human time by a vast amount. So mountains, um, you you get a kind of feeling of geological time in Chinese paintings, whereas you don't particularly get that in Western paintings. You get something which is much more human-centered. So you get a construct of nature, which is of landscape, which you don't have in, let's say, early Chinese painting. It's a sort of relationship between earth and sky, not between, not, not a triangulation between human nature and the landscape as a construction of human desire. So you get a feeling of human framing in Western painting. Whereas in Chinese painting or Japanese painting later on, you don't get a perspective, you get a, a, a sort of infinite, you just get a, a little slice of nature which extends itself outside of the scroll a very good essay by Norman Bryson called Vision in the Extended Field, which is on Cheshire. But it explains the difference between Western perspectival scene and the floating space of Far Eastern painting, where you get multiple perspectival views, you don't get a single viewpoint. And that implicates. Um, and multiple viewpoints is beyond the human viewpoint. This is Turner. Turner developed a dynamic relationship to landscape that incorporated mythic and historical passages, nature convulsed by storms, scenes relating to the advent of industry and the presentation of the sublime. Can someone tell me the two forms of sublime? Well, if you're referring to Kant, it would be mathematical and the dynamical. Yes. And what what are the distinguishing features of the sublime in relationship to beautiful? 
What, um, what would you say? How do you define the difference between the beautiful and the sublime? Well, again, Kent would make, as you would know better than me, uh, that uh, the beautiful was founded in nature, whereas the sublime is, is formless. Um, um, One's a beauty is the harmony of the faculties and the sublime is the discord of the faculties of imagination and the understanding. Beauty is something that we all would believe to be true, according to Kant. We would assert it to be true, believing it would believe, believe it's part of common sense. I don't think the sublime is the same for Kant. I, I would think that for Kant, but again, I, I think others disagree, that there, there was the commonality and sub, of beauty and taste, but I, I don't know that he necessarily agreed that there was universality in the sublime, but I, I, I would argue that there would be. Jonathan, can you can you say that statement again? Hi, can you say that statement again, that, that the beauty is the faculty um, of the The harmony of the faculties. It's like the faculties are moving in 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 self accord, but so produces a kind of sense of wow. So beauty is on the it's not not a rep, it can't be represented. It's just like a release yeah. of this like, harmony of faculties, and the sublime is the discord of faculties. So it's a it divides the subject into a descent which is the, the, the imagination not being able to grasp, for instance, infinity, and the ascent of reason, which is able to understand it through the idea. So it's partly the, it, the, the sublime is mind. Yes. It's, it's, not, talks. it's not mountains, it's not mountains and stormy oceans, it's the mind in, in relationship to it. And you yeah. have to have a moral attitude yeah. It's not just that you, everyone has a relationship to sublimity. It's, it's, it's a lofty attitude. It's uh, the elevation of the moral, moral standing of the in individual who comes to see or recognize the, the sublime experience. So it's a moral accord as well. Could you say that, oh, sorry. Uh, I was say, could you say a sublime experience is also beautiful? Well, it gets mixed up later with people like Rilke, the poet, saying that beauty is a terror, is a, is is taking to you to the edge of terror. So it does get mixed up with different thinkers. Burke is, for instance, very prescriptive about sublimity. He says it's got certain qualities, certain colours, certain certain things which can be prescribed as sublime, whereas Kant is much more uh, evasive on that level, much more abstract. And, and Deleuze, was it Deleuze that said that, that it was the, the sensation of the sublime is imagination recoiling at its limit, recoiling at re having reached its limit, right? It's Nancy. Nancy. Nancy oh. says that the sublime is... The, the limit of is the limit is trembling at the limit. Is it, is it, so it describes it as a trembling of the subject at its limit. So it's something which happens to the subject, and it's really a pre precursor to the idea of the uh, the centered subject, really. And that's partly why the sublime becomes interesting to philosophers in the late twentieth century, early. Um, early part of this century, you get Leotard writing at length about the sublime, Nancy writing, um, all sorts of other terms used for the sublime. All um, you get Zizek and the sublime, so there's a sublime object. So it's become a very rich terrain in recent history. It almost replaced the the sense of uh, political discourse uh, shifted into the idea of the sublime and the limit experience.
but we need to keep going over these debates to get get hold of the implications. Derrida is another one who talks at length about the sublime. Uh, so this is another Turner landscape with water, eighteen forty to forty five. So you can see elements which. I mean, in another context, could look like a Chinese song painting from the 12th century. Mm. It's an old sketch by Constable. Another old sketch by Constable. Don Constable created a whole series of studies of cloud formations. As the landscape was increasingly viewed as an object of human control, then painters and poets turned upwards to the sky as an emblem of freedom. So already they begin to feel the effects of industrialism and that the, the earth or the world was being used as an object of um, control, manipulation. So there's a sort of move towards zones of nature which were untouched or seemingly untouched uh, by this control, kind of relationship between necessity and freedom, which was first articulated by Kant, then later on by Marx. Hakusai and Hiroshige developed a sustained relationship to the art of landscape depiction through serialized encounters. They in turn exerted a profound influence on Impressionism and Post-Impressionism through the use of flat color and unusual design. The, um, this is the first part of the 19th century, first half of the 19th century um, Japanese woodblock prints, but they came to particularly to Paris they're often called penny prints on markets because they were used to wrap up porcelain. So they were more or less throwaway at that time. So a lot of artists, including Van Gogh and Monet and almost Degas, almost all of the Impressionists had a familiarity with Japanese woodblock prints. And this use of flat colour and unusual sort of design features and serialization. So an album of prints of just uh, mountains or uh, journeys. This is a Hokusai, famous Hokusai, Mount Fuji. Lord Monet often worked on serial investigations of the changing patterns of light. So undoubtedly they were influenced by Far Eastern serialization of a whole album telling kind of telling a story. So the water lilies. It's Van Gogh. He did studies of um olive trees in particular, not, he loved the sort of gnarled appearance of olive trees. Just yes. last one, London. Sorry, last, last one. one. Vincent van Gogh did a series of paintings based on the study of, of olive trees. This example is dated from 1889. This is a Cezanne. <clears throat> Painter of a forest. Kate. Paul Cezanne said that the landscape thinks in me and I am its consciousness. So increasingly, figures like Cezanne was, were thinking about the difference between a subject, a, a, a subject perceiving and an object being depicted and the kind of circularity of the relationship between landscape and consciousness or mind and matter, or mind and nature. He's going to say something. In attempting to be true to a vision, 
sorry, I have a little, uh, I have to move your the picture of you. Okay. <laughs> In attempting to be true <clears throat> to vision, doubt is a necessary contingent feature of this quest. And Merleau-Ponty, is yeah. that correct? Thus locates this feature of Cezanne not within the psychological matrix of the artist, but in the nature of the project itself. Cezanne is figured left to himself between the world itself and the world to be painted with only the gesture of painting as a means of creating a unity of vision. Because he has returned to the source of silent and solitary experience on which culture and exchange, exchange of ideas have been built in order to take cognizance of it, the artist launches his work just as a man once launched the first word. It is the mobility of the body directed into the visible world that is through the medium of gesture transformed visibly into painting in an act of folding the one into the other. In this context, it is a form of visibility that is realized as an act of becoming and as such a form of secret overcoming of the duality that might otherwise diminish, if not vanquish, the possibility of such an act. The world is not displayed in front, but rather is understood as an emergence with the body that is lent to it. And it is this that it is this that paths the way to, to the appearance of a new visibility. There are no predeterminations that govern this, just the traces of color out of which emerges the act of making visible. I would ask you to read it again, but it's quite a complex passage. I don't mind if you want to hear it again. I wouldn't mind reading it again, actually. We just listen to it again. In attempting to be true to vision, doubt is a necessary contingent feature of this quest. And Merleau-Ponty thus locates this feature of Cezanne not within the psychological matrix of the artist, but within the nature of the project itself. So if you stop there, there's, there's the whole thing about Cezanne's doubt. So you come across the phrase says on doubt, this is what it, it's referring to. Cezanne is figured left to himself between the world itself and the world to be painted with only the gesture of painting as a means of creating a unity of vision. Because he has returned to the source of silent and solitary experience on which culture and exchange of ideas have been built in order to take cognizance of it, the artist launches his work just as a man once launched the first word. It is the mobility of the body directed into the visible world that it that is through the medium of gesture transforms visibility into painting in an act of folding the one into the other. In this context, it is a form of visibility that is realized as an act of becoming and as such a form of secret overcoming of the duality that might otherwise diminish, if not vanquish, the possibility of such an act. The world is not displayed in front, but rather is understood as an emergence within the body that is lent to it. And this, and it is this that paths the way to to the appearance of a new visibility. Sorry, I mangled it. That's a beautiful sentence too. <laughs> there are no predeterminations that govern this, just the traces of color out of which emerge the act of making visible. I mean, that phrase, act of making visible is important. And that gives us the difference between representation and the becoming a vision. A, vi a vision is a process which uh, takes place through bodily perception. The whole thing is very, um, very bodily. It's about, you know, you feel that your body has to be connected to what you're seeing in order to represent. It's a very physical kind of feeling that you get from reading this pa passage. It's, um, Cezanne is marvellous. He's, he's, he's some of the mo most memorable passages in Meloponte is his writings on Cezanne and later on Giacometti. It's just the same doubt that um, that um, Descartes had or used to unravel the co cogito. I mean, There's a different cogito then underneath the surface of the painting. I mean, right. That, that doubt is. He writes is that about what that Descartes. He, he takes Descartes to task, but he he does write on in detail about Descartes and the cogito. But it shifts it, it the sensible to the bodily. So he's, he's opposed to 
uh, Descartes' separation of body and mind. I think um, so is, uh, there's another one who wrote about Descartes as well, and he's also completely opposed to Descartes. He goes back to the Cartesian meditations in the same way. Another phenomenologist, I've forgotten his name, a German. Del. But yeah, they start with Descartes and this yeah. sense of doubt. Husserl, sorry, I was thinking. It is uh, early Matisse. The Fauvist movement emerged out of a desire to liberate color from its relationship to shadow. Matisse, Duran, Brock, and Vlamnik led this anti mimetic pro program. Andre Duran, Abre a Collier. I don't speak French. <laughs> <laughs> now, after the outbreak of color, we get the First World War. And Paul this, Nash, oh, sorry. This Paul Nash painted scenes from both world wars. In We Are Making a New World, 1918, the landscape is utterly subject to devastation. He carried the process of being witness into the Second World War. And in a way, it became much more of an aerial warfare. This is a painting about the Battle of Britain. You see planes crashing down to the earth. What is the... Uh... Do you know where that's supposed to be with a sort of windy river? I'm not sure. Thames or I don't know, not really the Thames. But... He painted in uh, the uh, the Norfolk and Suffolk, I think, quite a lot. Right. Ken. A bit Devon Inlet. Because that's, that's the uh, Bitfires were based. This is stationed in Kent and some in Suffolk, I think. They're not all put in centralised places, they're quite small airfields. This is uh, Nolder. Emile Nolder was one of the first expressionist painters as a member of the Dybruck. He wrote, there is silver blue, sky blue, and thunder blue. Every color holds within it a soul. I mean, it is very paradoxical. I mean, he was inclined towards Nazism, but it's also an expressionist <laughs> painter, and they, the Nazis burnt <laughs> masses of expressionist paintings regardless of the orientation of the painters, they're seen as decadent. Nolder. Paul Clay, yeah. Joyful Mountain Landscape, 1929? Max Ernst. The depiction of landscape themes in Max Ernst assume a relationship to a post-human world that is possessed by menace. Edward Weston, Juniper at Lake Tenya, Tanaya, 1937. Again, we get this feeling of something which outlives human time. These trees which have lasted hundreds of years which you which you've got you you've got in America trees which really are almost beyond history, even where they survive as ruins of trees. George O'Keefe was one of the leading figures in the advent of American modernism. 
After living in New York until 1929, she eventually settled in New Mexico and was inspired by the landscapes that became the source of her vision. This is a painting by de Kooning. He used huge brushes. He was a, he, he did house painting and he kept the brushes from house painting and used these huge brushes. So big paintings with big brush strokes. And in a sense, an ambiguity between landscape infused with the body, you get the feeling of flesh infusion with wheat fields or so he mixes up body sky land william de kooning produced landscape sorry large scale paintings that have that evoked the feeling of landscapes these paintings serve to dis dissolve the relationship between the distinction of object and subject and instead focus on pure sensation The de Kooning. He it's used to fun. he used to turn the painting upside down and start again or rotate it. In fact, when he was more successful, he built a device so he could rotate the painting mm -hmm. and stand back at a very long distance with a long brush so his painting could be rotated automatically. Um, it was, he always turned it upside down and wrapped and repainted over and over again. You can kind of see that in it. Yeah, it loses positionality. Again, it's a kind of dissolving of perspectival space, a flattening of space, but a kind of sensuality of that flattening. And a sort of dissolution of the distinction between like a sense of bodily space and landscape space or natural space. Richard Diebenkorn, Ocean Park series, but I can't read the rest of it. Began in 1967 and consisted of 145 paintings. The series was consisted of that many paintings. It became quite a repetitive as the feature of his work. This particular painting is my earliest memory ever in a museum. I just yeah. want to say that out loud. Yeah, <laughs> I was six. It was at San Francisco MoMA. What was the wild feeling like? It was It was an incredible thing. My mom actually picked me up so that I could see the yellow, like the thin layers crossing up high. And I, yeah, it was unbelievable. It was as big as the world. I think that's why, I think that's one of the reasons why I, my painting is large scale because my first impression of painting was so big. And so much wow, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Mind blowing. That incoherent, that, that sort of gestural release, which comes with the first experience of being turned on by a painting or a. Vija Selman's Clouds from 1968. And that's Vija Selman's Desert from 75. These are drawings. Robert Berry, Detail, Inert Gas Series, Helium. Sometime during the morning of... March the 5th, 1969, two cubic feet of helium will be released into the atmosphere. That was the, the conceptual, the, there's a photograph and the the piece of writing which goes with it. So the, the writing is where the the intentionality of the artwork is embedded. So you just get a visual trace. So this idea of visualizing or not being able to visualize helium being released into the atmosphere. This is Robert Smith's Spiral Jetty from 1970. 
which is one of the most uh, frequently evoked works of all of land art. It's also a really interesting work in that it's an essay and a film and the work itself. So it wasn't just a physical work, it was also a textual work and it was also a, a time-based work. And the, the sculpture itself or the installation itself is time-based and it disappeared back into the into the salt lake and was restored. Spiral jetty. I, yeah, I had a friend who visited there about uh, seven, seven, eight years ago, etc. He was a British man living in New Zealand at that time. He traveled to there, particularly experienced it before it really <laughs> disappeared, etc. He said it was in pretty region of a shape. That was a few years back. Seven, eight years ago. I mean, it's been restored. Well, it, it went underwater for about a decade, and then the the, the lake receded again. With a, and there was a big brine outbreak. Anyway. Yeah. Walter De Maria produced Lightning Field in 1977. It is located in the high desert of western New Mexico. The work consists of 400 polished stainless steel posts sp spaced 220 feet apart. Yoshiko Ueda, a series of photographs he took. Yoshihiko Ueda formed a fascination with the depiction of remote forests left untouched by human intervention. I have no interest in landscape photography that has been taken based on a preconceived notion of the word landscape. There must be a rediscovery born out of a personal relationship between that person and nature. Ueda. The brushwood wheezed, the moss shone an impossibly phosphorescent green that seemed to radiate from everywhere over the mammoth trees that strained heavenward. A manifold of living colors interfused, saturated with rain and light. I had discovered a realm of primordial chaos. I was witness to what was not for human eyes to see. To be sure, as I gazed through the viewfinder of the darkened box, I was shaking. I was overjoyed at my experience, such keen excitement and apprehension yet anew. My hand, wet with rain as I tripped the shutter release, seemed to tremble slightly. This time, I whispered a few brief words of thanks to the spirits of the forest. Yoshihiko Ueda, 1993. That was beautiful reading. Thank you. Beautiful text. I mean, I'd like, to, I mean, it'd be great to see more writing like that from artists. Where you just get a kind of pure release, a kind of just an excess. It's Howard Hodgkin. Howard Hodgkin's work, Rain, 1984 to 9, evokes the mood of being part of a landscape. There's a process of recollection of both sensation and the formation of memory. Howard Hodgkin collected Indian miniatures and was influenced by them in his use of color and mood. Basoli, 1685. The Punjab Hills. I mean, they're really fabulous paintings. They got such great color. This is the 17th, 18th century, that school in particular. I'm sorry, that's never happened before. That's my studio phone ringing and I don't want you to listen. Uh, show, me, show me Tomatsu from 1971. One of the great post-war Japanese photographers passed away about five years ago.
Landscape art is often employed to highlight human states of isolation, fragility, or emptiness. Who wants to read next? I'm, ha <clears throat> I'm happy to give it a go. Okay, Lester. Gerhard Richter, Seascape, Green Gray, Cloudy, 1969. I mean, it's almost as if he's reiterating earlier German um, uh, um, romanticism. Michael Andrews, The Cathedral, The Northeast Faced, Uluru, Ayers Rock, 1985. This is a very big painting. Ayers Rock is a sacred site for the native Australian people acting as a nodal point of all the accumulated lines of energy <clears throat> which are etched into the land. This implies that the land is a living body. Again, this idea of lines of chi, or in Australian context, the song lines. These were almost um, ritually re-articulated as lines which had songs embedded in the memory, memories of the people, of the ancestors. The David Hockney, a sort of panoramic American landscape. David Hockney opened out his relationship to landscape when he was living in California. When he returned to Yorkshire, this preoccupation became a central passion. That's one of his Yorkshire landscapes. This is a Peter Doig painting. Peter Doig's painting, Milky Way, 1989 to 1990, is an image of enchantment. His work presents many different locations and imaginative configurations of place. Anselm Kiefer, Der Morgenthau Plan, 2014. Another Kiefer. Agnes Dennis created her work Wheatfield confrontation in 1982 in the shadow of the Twin Towers and where she's walking is now Battery Park City in Lower Manhattan. Yeah. I mean, it's such a surprising image, isn't it? With <laughs> the whole wheat field. Ronnie Horn, Stillwater, The River Thames, for example, 1999. The work consists of images taken along the extent of the River Thames with the serial textural text that runs parallel to the image, images. That was one of the great works she did. It's both a book and an exhibition. And Jonathan, who is the artist? Maybe you mentioned it earlier. Did all the pencil drawings of water? Oh, my Yuan. No, no, a, a different, different artist. Uh, it'll come to me. Sorry, I'm just. I mean, the photographic artist who did water uh, seascapes was Hiroshi Sugimoto. This is a still moving image film by Mustafa Hulusi. Mustafa Hulusi presented a moving image work based on the depiction of poppy fields shot in Turkey in 2010. Mustafa Hulusi, 
Recollections of <coughs> Recollections of Underdevelopment 12, 2015. You get in Cyprus these incredible trees, which olive trees, which I don't know. I, I wrote a bit of a fiction here. An old man said to him that olive trees endure time because they have discovered a way of circulating ancient breath that they retain within their root system. That is a romance and a fiction, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a still from... In the moving image work, the Empty Near East, 2011, Mustafa Halusi presents a fictional catastrophe that rendered Cyprus empty of all human presence. In the wake of this regional disaster, nature reasserts its hold on the ecology. I think we've seen a fragment of that film last year. Daniel Kramer. Mountain, Trilogy, 2007. You see a series of forest photographs and mountain photographs and underwater photographs in a trilogy of landscapes. Daniel Gustav Kramer created a trilogy of landscape configuration based on forests, mountains, and underwater photographs. Within these images, there is a great sense of subjective encounter. Like it often when he was in a forest, he'd walk for several hours and he might hear a twig breaking and he took a photograph stimulated by the twig breaking rather than a visual, a visual stimulus. So we're waiting for something to happen, he let something occur. Um, so it wasn't just like compositional photography. It was like a, a surprise. Something happened. Here's the outcome. Here's one of his forest photographs. <clears throat> Is he using a 10-8 camera or something? It's, I think he's got a Leica. Oh, okay. So it's a small format, I think. It's very oh, detailed. Amazingly detailed. Mm. I think it's very good Leica. I think. Yeah. I think when he did underwater, he had a special camera for underwater photography. And maybe the mountains had a different camera. But I think he wanted the mobility of walking in the forest, not planting a, a large format camera somewhere and photographing, not a composition. It's funny, as you look at them, they get clearer and clearer. Well, they do for me anyway. So your eye gets used to the mist, sees through the mist. This is a painting by George Shaw. George Shaw's landscape paintings draw upon the English poetic tradition as well as a mood that derives from abjection. This is uh, Esther Teitman. The work of Esther Teitman <clears throat> takes us into places of darkness, caves, swamps, remote seas, shadowy rooms, all spaces that appear to congeal time. The question in circulation is, are these both the first and the last places where the desire for another light stirs? Something is in the air, like a strange vapor that cannot be named. John Akomfra's film, Installation Vertigo Sea, 
2015, fuses together images of the slave, slave trade, whaling, migration with the idea of the yet to come. There is a vast sweep with both scale. <coughs> there is a vast sweep with both scale and memory pertaining to the relationship of geography and history. Did anyone see this? I think about before lockdown, there was an exhibition of film and mainly film work, moving image work. It was shown. Oh, I think it's John O'Conference's work or other people's. Yeah, John O'Conference. There's other people as well, but his work stood out in particular. I, I didn't, I missed it, but he's, I love his work. Yeah, I think it's very good. He, he talks a lot about Walter Benjamin and dialectical image in conjunction with his work. This is a still from David Lean's film, Lawrence <clears throat> of Arabia. When David Lean made Lawrence of Arabia in 1962, <clears throat> it was both a narrative and a portrait of the desert, of the desert landscape. Ultimately, the affairs of history dissolved into the shifting sands. The sight of wild meadows had started to be quite rare, but has started to reoccur as a pattern of development, both within urban and countryside locations, in response to a lack of biodiversity. I mean, it's interesting in London, a lot of the parks have spaces now given over to wild meadow, or at least attempts at making a wild meadow. Has anyone seen really well maintained wild meadows? I mean, a lot of farmers have started to put space aside for them. Maybe not a lot, but it's become a pattern. There was a great project that actually I helped plant in um, Hyde Park, and it was um, the work of Dr. Daisy Ginsberg. And she had developed this idea of a pollinator pathway garden scheme. So she worked out a way of actually seeing um, a pollinator path um, through the eyes of a bee or a, a pollinator. Um, the way they see the colors, the way they try to make the shortest route back to back to base, you know, once they've done all their, collected all their pollen. And then she created these schemes with AI and then um, planted the, the, the garden. So it's quite an interesting idea that we shouldn't be planting for our aesthetic pleasure, but actually, well, what would it look like if we plant it for, with pollinators in mind? Mm. Amazing. Did you? Are there any photographs of of the? Of the yeah, park? there's there's photographs of the actual gardens, and then there's photographs of the scheme, and then there's like this the way the scheme works its way out, and then there's photographs of what they imagine from the the bee's eye view, basically of how the colours look, all sort of very purples and yellows, and all sort of very strange colours. So you know, instantly the garden that we see is a totally different garden to the one that they see. So it's interesting to see through their eyes. Did you put um, a link on the chat? Yeah, sure. Thanks. So I'll read this page and then we should hand off to somebody else. Mm. So in the book, World Spectators, Kaya Silverman discusses the relationship of vision and things. She says that when we look, she says that when we look in the most profound and creative sense of that word, we are always responding to a prior solicitation from creatures and things. This solicitation is aesthetic in nature. The world addresses us through its formal parameters. <clears throat> However, in displaying their colors, shapes, patterns, and movements to us, things do not merely request us to turn our eyes towards them or even to answer in kind. What the world of phenomenal forms solicits from us is our desire. The language of things <clears throat> is a language of presence. Desire, on the other hand, is virtually synonymous with absence. 
It is only through the fading of our being that each of us is inducted into this fundamentally visual language. Thus, the phenomenal world and the singular language of desire is the meeting of absence and presence through the mediation of care. The condition of this meeting is the openness of the perceiving subject toward the perceptual object and in turn the condition of being open is found in renouncing the claims of mastery over the language of desire. It means indeed to surrender one's signifying repository to the world to become the space in which the world itself speaks. For Silverman, the world also intends to be seen by infinity of eyes because even those creatures and things at which we look with pleasure exceed our capacity to see them. That's an amazing last sentence. For Silverman, the world intends to be seen by an infinity of eyes because even those creatures and things at which we look with pleasure exceed our capacity to see them. She was a Lacanian and she started to read Heidegger. So it's a sort of a meeting point between Heideggerian um, thinking and a thinking on Lacan. Because particularly the absence and presence through the mediation of care, that's very much Heidegger, you would have Yeah, thought. that's Heidegger. <clears throat> So passing on the baton here. Who's going to come next? It's not very long to go. Not five, five. <clears throat> Landscape is often posed as a setting for human action. Landscape can be defined in part by the resistance to human intervention, hence various connect connotations related to wilderness or rawness. Alongside all the solid forms that compose different landscape formations, there are also mists, vapours, fogs, fires, floods that lead to the obscuring of boundaries between things. Sebastião Salgado is a Brazilian documentary photographer who has spent six years recording life within the forest. Salgado describes the forest as the world's largest single natural laboratory. Nature has been transformed into an object of anxiety. The history of landscape art reminds us of quite different ways of seeing that are not framed by objection. Ecological thinking is also aesthetic in that it informs us of principles beyond instrumental design of our outcomes. This is a photograph by Salgado of the Amazon. Last one. The mysterious quality of artworks is a signal of the mysterious quality of objects in general. Beauty is a secret that we know exists, but whose content we don't know. When we share it with other, it's as if we are in on the same secret. We look at each other in amazement or with knowing look, but it's impossible to specify what the secret is. Only the fact that there is a secret is of any importance. Beauty is based on the raw fact of the secret as such. Timothy Morton. He writes on ecological thinking, but he, he, he teaches poetry in a university. So a lot of his thinking is based on the relationship between ecology and ideas of beauty. That's it. Okay. 
very good. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Is it a new one? That's very new. I liked it. I'd love to see um, Frederick Church in there with those icebergs. I mean, there's a lot of things I've not put in. I always think afterwards what, I, what I've left out, but it's how it works out when you do it. Yeah. They're one take forever. So we've got a presentation. Yeah. Let's